Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Garrity. If you were at our recent virtual event, New at Intercom, you will have heard about some of the amazing new products we have just launched. One of those products is Intercom Surveys, which allows companies to ask questions from right within their product at exactly the right time and place, and then take direct action with the answers and insights they get. That's because Intercom is a single connected platform. So the survey results can trigger powerful workflows for everyone, from the sales team, to the marketing team, to the support team. It's so innovative and it got me thinking about the path that led to this point. The history of surveys is essentially the history of the technology used to collect and interpret the information. As tech has developed, so has our capacity to know ourselves at a large scale. We've all experienced this tech at some stage in our lives. Take Zoe Sinnott. Zoe is a senior product manager at Intercom and one of the team behind Intercom Surveys. I remember as a kid, my parents filling out the paper census and I remember being really curious about what it was and why we had to do it. But I think I was reflecting on the last time I filled out a census was uh, I was living in Canada a few years ago and I was really pleased to see that they'd actually moved the census to be online. So that was that was real progress. But what made me laugh was that they still sent someone around to knock on your door to, to make sure you filled it out. <laughs> so yeah, it hasn't changed too much. It's true. Someone literally called to my door the other day to drop in the form for Ireland's 2022 census. And actually, that's a pretty good place to start for today's episode. A deep dive into this world. The story of the technology behind asking questions and discovering more about people at scale. Okay, let's see. Census of Population of Ireland... Name, Liam, Garrity, what is your place of birth? Dublin. I'm filling out the census form. It's been six years since the last one. The first ever Irish census was in 1821, after an unsuccessful attempt in 1813. And while filling in all of my answers, marking each little box, it strikes me that it's kind of an amazing system that in one shape or another has been around for thousands of years all over the world. Asking questions leads to knowledge, and the world has always sought to find out more. And not just about our population size or place of birth, but about every aspect of our lives. Surveys have evolved to allow everyone from your local pet store to huge multinational corporations to ask for our opinions on their products and services. This curiosity and passion to push forward using surveys all started with the census. In a way, it was the original big data. I mean, it's, it's kind of wild to think about, but there was a, a point in time when, you know, data on, on the scale of like megabytes was kind of hard to come by. And the census was one of the sources of, of material, you know, censuses and, and tax records, say, were the, the kind of things that governments kept track of at the level of millions of people. And practically nobody else in society kept observations on, on that many things. So it really, at least for, for perhaps, say, 100 years, the, the technology of data and, and census taking really grew hand in hand. That's Andrew Whitby, author of The Sum of the People, How the Census Has Shaped Nations from the Ancient World to the Modern Age. It's difficult to pin down like a precise earliest example, in part because censuses seem to be so old. So they really crop up in, in kind of mythologies of different cultures, you know, in times where we really can't be very precise about dating or even precise about whether they existed at all. But, you know, you can find censuses in the Old Testament of the Bible. The first kind of mention of a census is in the book of Exodus. There's a description of a census taking procedure, which is kind of a tax collection, like a lot of these early censuses were, of, of collecting half a shekel from each person as you count them with that money going towards the construction of the, the tabernacle is kind of temple in the desert. So, you know, in Judeo-Christian tradition, you have that kind of early census taking, but you find the same thing in, for instance, Chinese mythology. You'll find a census from a, you know, similarly sort of 2,000 years before the common era of the census of Yu the Great, who was kind of famous kind of mythological emperor of China who was responsible for a lot of the kind of flood mitigation effort that made much of the terrain of China a kind of livable, viable agricultural area. And, and he was said to have taken the first census of China. So you, you find these things dating many, many thousands of years ago. And I think we can kind of assume that whether or not those events actually happened, there really was some sort of census taking going on at that time. The word census is a Roman word. It comes from the Latin consere, 
to assess. And that kind of indicates that, that there is this strong connection to the Romans. So the Romans had a, a kind of census procedure through the Republican period and the, into the empire where they would, they would use the census to kind of structure their society. So very different from the census of today, which is kind of an anonymous exercise. You know, you, today you, you fill out a form, it goes into some kind of statistical aggregate, and then those aggregates just published back out. There's no individual information. The, the Roman census was very different from that. It was you sort of stood before these, these censors, these important officials of Roman system, and you would kind of declare yourself. You would say, you know, who you were, what your age was, uh, you know, who your wife was, how many children you had, what kind of financial income and lands you might have. And that was used to kind of establish the strata of Roman society. So the Roman census is, is one of the most sort of famous historical census taking systems. And, and that's where we get the modern word from. Censuses were taken on everything from bundles of knotted thread to wax tablets engraved on stone if they were to be recorded. But eventually, a technology would arrive that would transform communication and record keeping. Paper. But the problem with paper is it becomes kind of large and unwieldy. So in the United States, you have this period where the, the population had grown very dramatically from maybe 4 million in the first 1790 census to you know many multiples of that afterwards. But also the number of questions becomes a lot larger. So the initial US census is really just asking for a few basic characteristics for sort of you know sex and age and, and race because it was a kind of was some some sort of racial distinctions made particularly to do with the, the history of slavery. But later on they start asking a lot more questions around you know occupations and, and disability and education and things like this. And so this number of census questions becomes dramatically larger. And so at some point you reach this kind of crisis point where you need to have some way of being able to kind of, I mean, literally physically manipulate this paper. Think about that. Millions of entries, no spreadsheet software. Census officials struggled to quickly and accurately process the information they'd collected. That is, until chief clerk of the census, Charles Seaton, invented the Seaton device. It was a big breakthrough in how all this data could be interpreted. Okay, so imagine you work at the census office. You have this questionnaire on a large, wide sheet of paper. Looks similar to a spreadsheet you'd see nowadays. But say you want to compare some of the columns, like results for men and results for women. But because it's this big sheet of paper, they're all spread out. They're not side by side, so it's just awkward. This is where the Seaton device comes in. And so the Seaton device had this kind of complicated system of rollers where you could sort of spread that you could take the this wide sheet and roll it through these rollers so that two columns would appear side by side that were actually spread out on the paper and so to me it's just it's just the exact functionality of like the hide columns feature in in Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or a modern spreadsheet but it's being done physically mechanically with paper and so that was like one way that these kind of census officials developed to try and deal with this this massive paper that had become you know really difficult to work with as tabulating machines evolved so too did America the United States Census of 1880 came at a crucial time in U.S. history. The country itself was going through this massive transition from a mostly rural country to increasingly concentrated in urban locations. The population was growing. That's Rick Clough. Currently the chief technology innovation officer for the state of California. And Rick says the country was coming into its own as an industrial power. And the census had an increasingly important role, not least of which was to determine how the political representation would be assigned. Of course, it's dependent on population, where those people are, how many people there are. And the census was the only way the government had to know what those numbers were and how to then make the political allocations that would come from it. The problem with a growing country was that the census was also growing. The government was collecting more data than it could tabulate. The 1880 census didn't finish getting calculated until eight years later. Or put another way, only two years before the next census was due to start. Well, and you imagine, like, if you, you go into that decade wanting to know how are we going to allocate political representation? How are we going to assign taxes? How are we going to figure out all of these sort of necessary dependencies that we take for granted today? They then had to wait for eight years before they even had the raw data that would allow them to act on it, which of course isn't all that convenient. This is where a guy named Herman Hollerith comes in. He was a clerk in the census office in 1880, 
though he didn't stick around for the conclusion of the census. Who can blame him? He was a pretty precocious guy, had completed college in his mid-teens, and I think he was 18 or 19 years old that he had a job in the census office and got to see firsthand just how broken the process of collecting, analyzing, and reporting on that data was. Shortly after being frustrated by that job at the census, he left to go become a mechanical engineering professor at MIT at the age of 22. So he was not a particularly patient individual, as near as we can tell. Which probably helped get Hollerith thinking about a machine that could speed up the process. He just needed some inspiration. One of these fascinating coincidences, he had a brother-in-law, I think it was, who was active in the textile business. And at some point, Herman and this brother-in-law, I think, shared an apartment or a home. And the brother-in-law had in the textile business used something that had existed for decades called the jacquard loom, which was essentially using punch cards to store very complex designs for textiles. So this notion of using punch cards for complex processes was not new to Herman Hollerith, at this point was nearly a century old in the textile business. Regardless, it was exactly the inspiration Hollerith needed. The textile use, they were storing data. But what Hollerith had figured out that he could do is that if there was stored data on the punch cards, he could build a machine that could then count what was stored and store the derivation of those calculations. So... If you think about the purpose of a census is you're, you're capturing a lot of stored data about how many people and what their demographics are, where they live. He was then able to build a machine that counted the stored data and did so, as you might imagine, at a far greater speed and with far higher accuracy than they'd been able to do before. Hollerith set to work on building his machine. Well, I I think necessity is the mother of invention, quite literally here. The census office held a contest. They said, if anyone wants to try and help us solve this problem, we'll hire you. Only three people entered the contest. The third place submission tabulated the data that was the contest set in a little over 55 hours. Hollerith's machine did that 10 times faster in just over five hours. They put Hollerith's machine to work on the 1890 census. The job was done in just two years, saving the government $5 million. The U.S. was not the only country that needed to survey its population. He ends up starting a company. People began to see the potential for this, not just for censuses around the world, but for businesses. Because the data on the cards didn't have to be about population size. They could be about a customer or a product. He then finds essentially adjacent businesses where the storage and tabulation of large data sets for insurance companies, for railroads, for post offices. He ends up doing business all over the globe. Insurance men talk in insurance terms, bankers in banking terms, manufacturers in their special language, and many businesses speak the language of distribution. I think this idea that machines can do things far faster than we can, I think that would look very familiar to him. I think in the past, Surveys were things others did to you. you. You were asked to fill out surveys. What the internet allowed us to do, it became possible for anyone to create a survey and have the data captured in a way that made it easier to summarize and synthesize. Okay, this is where we have to zip through history. 1947, it's now possible to use keyboards to input data instead of punch cards. 1963, the mouse as we know it today is created. 1975, the first portable computer. 1986, more than 30 million computers are in use in the United States. 1991, 
the World Wide Web. It spans the globe like a superhighway. It is called Internet. You can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. The World Wide Web was fast. Well, y- you know what I mean. For the first time, surveys could reach the entire population, not just of a country, but the world. Surveys that you used to get in, in the kind of early days of the web, in the sort of early 1990s, I remember kind of a lot what they looked like. Lots of circles with buttons in them and boxes. That's Tristram Hooley. Tristram is a professor of the Inland Norway University. In the past, he spent a number of years running online surveys for businesses, and he co-wrote the book What is Online Research?, in which the authors pinpoint the birth of the online survey. We reckon that the first online survey was in 1986. It was actually a survey about surveys, which is always a, always a nice Nice thing. So they were looking into, they were basically just figuring out whether it would work. So that's before the World Wide Web and internet has existed in various forms since about the 1960s. So by the kind of 80s, people were starting to experiment with this. So it's actually a pretty long history now. Similar to how Hollerith's tabulating machines were mostly used by governments first, the internet was largely used only by academics in scientific disciplines and the military in the 70s and 80s. What, what happens really from the 1990s then is that we get this sense that there is the general population are on it. And from the point of view of most of the kind of stuff that I'm interested in, that's when it really gets quite interesting because you start to be able to access some kind of subset of the general population through, through using online surveys. It becomes easier and easier. You don't have to be a kind of technical genius to start doing this stuff. And so then you start to see more and more people doing it. You know, once you get into the 2000s, you've got things like the sort of Web 2 technologies. And part of that, you get things like SurveyMonkey and so on coming along. And then it becomes kind of a complete ubiquitous plague of everybody doing it. So, yeah, over a kind of, I reckon, about a 20-year period, it goes from being a kind of really wild and new cutting edge thing to being something that almost every certainly almost every business has experimented with in some way and and many many social researchers and so on excuse me do you have a minute to take a survey the web really did transform surveys before then businesses took the traditional routes to find out what their customers thought you've always been able to get clipboard and go and stand out in the street and ask people questions and you've always been able to mail people surveys and you've always been able to call them up on the telephone or at least for 100 years or so been able to call them up on the telephone and ask them questions those things just became so much easier with the arrival of the internet you know some of the good things about that is it enables you to access a community that's much wider than the community that you might actually geographically be located in it allows you to reach out to some sorts of people who perhaps might not be just walking along the street or might not respond to phone calls or whatever. So it might allow you, for example, to survey populations like prisoners or disabled people who you wouldn't be able to access through kind of ordinary forms of surveying. So it's got a number of advantages. It, it opens up new, new possibilities. It also probably makes it a lot cheaper, although there are obviously still costs to it. If I really love a particular brand or if I really love a particular company or I go and use that company all the time, then I might might well want to have some influence about how they understand their customers, what they might want to produce in the future, how they might want to change their service and so on. So there's those things about your, your affiliation and affinity with the people who are asking you the questions. And you can hack that a little bit by personalizing things in various ways that, you know, we can do online. Just like when the American census had problems back in Hollerith's day, bringing surveys online comes with its own unique challenges. Well, I mean, the the biggest one is getting people to fill them in. And obviously, in the kind of current environment where there are 
literally millions of online surveys being sent to everybody every day. Many of them are very kind of questionable uh, probity, really. You know, people aren't massively inclined to fill it in. And you've got to get hold of a decent list of people. You know, just throwing it out on social media probably won't generate all that much. It does depend on who you are and what your brand is and so on. But, you know, so there's those kinds of issues. How do you get people to fill it in? And then obviously the big issue, depending on what you're doing this for, is that if you want to claim some sort of representativeness of what you're doing, then it's not just getting people to fill it in, but it's also getting the right people or the right spread of people to fill it in. And it's probably more difficult to do that with an online survey than it would be if you were to mail people at their homes and send them a you know a paper-based survey. You can probably make a better guess at who people are and how you get a representative sample. So that then moves people into kind of all sorts of statistical jiggery-pokery where you, you try and figure out, well, okay, I've got these people to fill it in. Can I extrapolate from this? You know, I've only got, you know, three young people to fill it in. Can I readjust these figures, weight it so that the number of young people is more akin to what it is in the population or whatever? And and that's where you start to get into some potentially more dangerous territory. So, so yeah, that's quite a big issue, really, is this idea of representativeness with, with online surveys. From the user side, and pretty much all of us have experienced these from time to time, badly made online surveys are a headache. One thing that really irritates me is when a business asks you something that I expect them to already know about me. So for example, they send a survey to your email asking you for some feedback. And then one of the questions in the survey is, what is your email address? And I just, yeah, think that that it's obviously not personal and then I'm not sure where the data is going. So that's definitely a pet peeve. That's Zoe Sinnott again, the senior product manager at Intercom who helped lead the development of Intercom surveys. I think another one is just when they ask too many questions, right? Like I'll answer four or five, probably no more. And you get bored and you drop off. And the last thing I'm I'm also, this this definitely may be just me, but I'm not a fan of the way some businesses kind of trick you into believing you can take the survey from an email. And you think, oh, great, the survey's in the email. I don't have to go anywhere. And then you click on it and then it pops open a new window. And you're like, oh, now I'm annoyed because I wanted wanted to be in my email, right? So I'm not really a fan of that either. So what's next for online surveys? How do you begin to change something that has become ubiquitous with our online lives and not always in a good way? Intercom Surveys is a new feature that we've just launched that allows our customers, businesses, to ask their customers questions. And they can do that in the context of their product. So across their web and mobile applications. And the surveys can be really targeted. So you can use all the power of Intercom in terms of the audience rules to make sure those surveys are targeted at the right people. And then the thoughts and feedback and sentiments that you capture are recorded and stored in Intercom in real time, which means that you can take actions based on the data you collect to drive tailored customer experiences, which is awesome. Zoe says this is really going to change how companies collect and implement customer feedback. We think of surveys in two parts. So the first is the surveys, the actual surveys themselves. And we think that they're better than traditional surveys already that you might receive via email, etc. in a number of ways. Because first of all, they're in context, which means that you're asking customers questions typically about the thing that they're currently doing in your product, right? And so you're more likely to get better response rates to that because they're already thinking about it and better quality response rates as a result too. The second thing is that they can reach users wherever they are. So be that your web application or in your mobile app. And they can also be sent via a link through like an email or a push notification too, if needed be. So they can also reach users wherever they are. As I mentioned already, they can be hyper-targeted so you can reach users at exactly the right moment. And they can be customized and personalized to make it look and feel like the brand and match their tone and style. So you can do things like change the color and make sure it fits with the page that the survey is being presented on. And you can include details about the customer, like their name or their company in the context of the survey itself. So it feels way more personal and actually doesn't even feel like you're being surveyed at all, really. The other part to Intercom surveys is the way that the data can now be leveraged through Intercom to drive actions and workflows in what Zoe says are really magic ways. That really involves the capabilities like being able to store the responses that you're getting as a user attribute in Intercom and then use that to send users down different paths in campaigns to give them a more personalized messaging experience 
Or you can use that data to personalize their support experience. And of course, do reporting and analysis using the data that you've collected directly in Intercom, or even send that data to other tools like Salesforce or Slack or wherever your teams are who might want to see that feedback too. So we think it's infinitely better than traditional surveys that were sent via email, which would typically get like low response rates, typically from a biased subset of users. So the data is not very reliable and it's normally captured in a tool that nobody has access to. So you can't really use the data to do very much. And it's pretty much a zero sum game, I think, for both the, the business who's asking for the feedback and the customers who are giving it, right? Zoe says one of the advantages of Intercom surveys is that it will be right there at the very moment it's needed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you think about like a a really simple experience. You want to find out what somebody's experience was like during the checkout process. They bought something from, from your online shop and you can either send them an email three days later and try and get them feedback or you can send a survey straight away right after they finished and you can get that feedback in the moment, right? Like it's infinitely more powerful. What do you think people like Herman Hollerith and Charles Seaton would make of how far we've come in this field? The surveys themselves haven't really changed that much. Obviously, they're more engaging and beautiful, but the nature of the survey is the same, right? I think what's incredibly different and what they'd be really shocked by is the speed at which we can go from thinking of a survey that we want to send to actually sending it and getting the results, because I imagine that took them months or years previously to do. Um, And then obviously the way that we can connect the data and automatically leverage it to drive really powerful actions, I think, is something that they, yeah, be amazed by too. My thanks to Andrew Whitby, Rick Clow, Tristram Hooley and Zoe Sinnott. You can find out more about Intercom Surveys and what it can do for your business on intercom.com. The only thing left for me to do is to finish filling out this census form. We'll be back next week for more Inside Intercom. Okay, what is your current marital status? Single. Single.